Hello everyone, welcome to World Social Work Day with the Canadian Association of Social Workers and the Senate of Canada. My name is Joan Davis Whalen, I'm the President of the Canadian Association of Social Workers and I'm so pleased to be with you here today. Today is a special event, it's our webinar that we're going to have that's celebrating National Social Work and World Social Work Day and it's unlike any other that we will be doing. March historically has been a time to come together and celebrate the impact of social workers have on their clients or communities and the health healthcare field, and we all know that social workers are essential. Although we may not be hosting in-person celebrations this year, CASW and the Senate of Canada have joined forces to host two online events aimed to celebrate and honour the work of social workers this past year. So our special panel today is comprised of three senators from the social work profession, and they're going to be talking about their ideas, uh, their experiences, peoples and places that have inspired them in their careers, the giants in social works, as well as the individuals in our communities that have molded and mentored each senator's professional paths within the profession. Before we start, I wanted to just do a little bit of housekeeping with you for anyone who's on this platform for the first time. As you can see, um, it's totally customizable. You can move everything around. You'll see the blue circles or widgets as we call them and the bottom of the screen and one of them is the chat where you can put in your questions and comments. We also have a wonderful person who's in the background helping us with any technical issues you may be having. The next is question and answers, any questions that you may have because we will have time at the end of our speakers chatting to do some questions and answers. There's also um, some abstracts that are available there that you're going to be able to go in and take a look at. And as well, we have handouts. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in the handouts, um, you're going to be able to see some important information, especially about um, Social Work Month and some uh, competitions that we have on the go and an opportunity for you to win some prizes. And I know social workers like myself, we love to win prizes. So please, if you haven't participated, please do so. Um, as well as um, there our speaker bio is there as well. Uh, during the course of this event, uh, you'll see the, there's like a film segment with a check mark, and that's the course com completion tracker. So you have to do 40 minutes of this event in order to get credit for it and next to that is studio my certificates and that's where you will print off your certificate or download it so just keep that in mind this is a really wonderful event and we're so happy today to have our three panelists with us so we are going to go ahead and start and because I'm eager to hear from each one of them so um, we're going to start and go from uh, I would think we'll just do Maybe we'll start uh, with Senator Bernard, who is a senator from Nova Scotia, East Preston, and uh, who's also the first African Nova Scotia woman to be appointed to the Senate of Canada, representing the province of Nova Scotia and her hometown of East Preston. And Senator Bernard champions issues impacting African Canadians and people living with disabilities. And she's particularly interested in human rights, employment, equi equity, and mental health. So I could go on Senator Bernard and read quite a bit about you, but I don't think uh, people want to hear me talk a lot today. Um, and I think that they are very much interested in hearing what yourself and your fellow senators have to say. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Joan. And thank you to CASW for working with us to organize this event. It's replacing our traditional uh, social work on the hill uh, event that we've been doing for the past few years. And I'm really pleased that COVID didn't stop us from connecting. And of course, in this format, we have people from across the country. So to start off, we were asked to talk a bit about the path that led us from the social work profession into our current work in the Senate. I would say that as a social worker, I've always been concerned about issues of oppression, issues of racism and intersectionality. My entire career has been devoted to addressing these issues, whether it was when I was working in, in direct practice or in community, in mental health, or in my teaching, research, uh, community development, and advocacy work. Much of the advocacy work that I've done over the years was actually done through my involvement with the Association of Black Social Workers and also the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women. 
I've always tried to link research policy and practice. I would say that my path from social work, from the social work profession into policy making was a bit of an unanticipated journey, a journey fraught with challenges, but also a journey with many opportunities. And the, the success that I've that I've that I've enjoyed is really building on the work of so many others. This theme, I am because we are, really speaks to me. I've always engaged in positive disruption, although I never used that term until I was invited to speak at the Faculty of Social Work by the Dean, Faculty of Social Work at, at the University of Calgary. And he'd had a he'd had a, a year long series that he called positive disruption. And, and I realized that it was positive disruption that's led me to be where I am today. I found the courage to become a positive disruptor because of many who'd gone before me. And as I said, the theme for today, I am because we are Ubuntu is very, very relevant. It is my journey, you could say. I am because they were, I am because we are, as we pay it forward. Early in my life, I benefited from two amazing social workers who were doing community development work in the community where I lived then and where I now live again of East Preston. It was part of the civil rights movement and community leaders were doing work to engage, to inspire and to motivate youth. And I was one of those youth, their names, uh, the late Eugene Williams and the late Calvin Ruck. And as many may know, Calvin Ruck went on to become a senator. So I, I'm clearly standing on his shoulders all the time. But I was also incredibly inspired later in my journey by Maxine Prevost Shepherd, the woman who called me one day in 1979 to discuss the idea of starting an association of black social workers. The audacity, the audacity to think that we could come together as a group of black social workers. And she asked me to come to help her with that. And I invited two other women to join us, Frances Mills Clements and Althea Tolliver. And together the four of us started that organization, which is now in its 42nd year. Other social workers that influenced my journey are Rosemary Brown and Alexa McDonough, social workers who, who became politicians, who used their voices and their influences to challenge oppressive policies and to fight for change, to make more effective policies that would benefit the most disenfranchised amongst us. As a social worker who is moonlighting as a senator, I chose to come to the Senate so that I could help to develop policy from a different lens, from a, from a lens of social justice, from a lens of social change. And one of the first stakeholder meetings I held in my new role as a Senator was with your executive director, Fred Phelps, uh, meeting with CASW and I'm sure Fred, you will, you will recall that historic meeting in my office on the Hill. And that's where the idea of social work on the Hill was born. And, and we continue, together we are stronger, together we are better. I am because we are. In 2020, a historic year where we saw the pandemic of COVID collide with the pandemic of racism. We recognize the significance of social work addressing issues of systemic racism and being actively engaged in that work. So as I reflect on my journey and the path that led me from the social work profession on the front lines into policy making, I want to be clear with the audience that I'm still a social worker who happens to be focused now primarily on policymaking from this location as a Senator. The lens of social work and the lens of social justice, which is so embedded 
in the social work lens that I choose, it's, it's essential. It is absolutely essential to the work that we do in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Bernard. Um, it's just amazing uh, as we start thinking about how our connections are still there from when we first started our social work careers and um, how we have uh, continued to um, to work for uh, individuals and for communities. So it's just so important. So I'm going to move now to Senator Nancy Hartling, who uh, was appointed to the Senate as an independent senator for New Brunswick in November of 2016. With a career focused on families and social issues, she's well versed on mental health, poverty, violence against women, and affordable housing. And she's advocated extensively for socioeconomic issues facing families, particularly single parents and their children. Uh, she's a dedicated proponent of social justice and human rights and an advocate for issues related to mental health, diabetes, and basic income. So, Senator Hartling, I'm going to turn the, uh, the stage over to you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone, and happy Social Work Month. Thanks to CSW for organizing these events during this month, and thanks to each of you for your contribution to social work across this country. You do make a difference. It's a different year across this country and a different way to host an event, not like we did last year and the year before on the Hill, but I'm delighted to be here and it's an honor to be a part of this panel with Senator Bernard and Senator Anderson along with Joan Davis Whalen, uh, the president of CASW. It allowed me to deeply reflect about how I was shaped as a person and my career and how I continue to grow, especially around racism, and justice and anti-racism. Although I am not a black, indigenous person of color, I am an ally and I continue to grow in this important role. Today I will share a little bit about my story about becoming a social worker and as Senator Bernard said, I, I think we're always social workers. They can't take that away from us. We're, we still practice no matter what and we, it's in our hearts so we continue that on the hill. But during my early life, I often traveled with my aunt who was a social worker in rural Nova Scotia. I sat quietly in her car while she did her home visits and I remember so clearly being in Africville and looking out the car window at the children and I wondered, could we be friends? Wondering about the families my aunt visited, this clearly impacted my future. Growing up in rural Nova Scotia was interesting but very homogeneous. Nevertheless, my curiosity was always keen, especially around social justice and people beyond our community and the world. I was drawn to social work and community development work and I'd like to share a little bit about my giants or I guess I'd say my mentors. I want to highlight a couple of mine, John Lutz and Ann Peary. I met John when I began going to university as an adult and he taught me my first course in social work and I was so excited to be there. John became a role model, mentor and friend. After over 40 years we are still in contact discussing issues. John grew up in Moncton area and he told me how his participation in the Boys and Girls Club led him to social work. He studied at McGill and Dalhousie. He spent much of his career working at Dorchester Penitentiary. He was involved with Indigenous people and taught courses to Indigenous students at St. Thomas University. But what strikes me about John is his compassion for others, his acceptance of difference and how he treats people with dignity. To John, social worker wasn't Social work wasn't a nine to five job. It's his calling, his way of life, even into his retirement. A few years later, when I was trying to get a nonprofit off the ground to assist single moms, I had the great fortune to meet Ann Peary, a social worker who I consider a friend and a mentor. Ann has been a confident, a cheerleader, and a very knowledgeable person along my journey. Her early life in a farm in Ontario led her curiosity and passion for social justice and then to social worker to social work studying at University of Western Ontario and Carleton. She's worked in Ontario, Alberta, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick in a variety of posts. Anne embraces social justice and her intersectionality on many levels. Her curiosity and her concern for others along with passion for social justice continue even into her retirement. I have interesting and lively discussions with both John and Anne on a regular basis and we explore the new realities since the pandemic steep with injustice and racism. I am so grateful to both of them because we never stop growing and learning. 
Since the beginning of my career, I was always hungry to learn and I took advantage of every course, workshop or book I could find. It was absolutely a peak time and I remember enjoy learning and long conversations about social justice. As a young woman, I became a feminist and so gender equality became an essential part of my life and my work. I was eager to change the world and I thought that I could do it quickly but I realize now it's taking a lot longer and and uh, I'm planting seeds along my journey. I read many feminist works by Gloria Steinem and others but one of my books that I read by Rosemary Brown, the author of Being Brown, who is one of my giants, who was a social worker, social advocate, author, and a politician who had moved to Montreal from Jamaica to study in 1951. One thing that struck me about her was how difficult she had to find an apartment in Montreal due to her color. And this kind of racism still is experienced today. But Rosemary broke down many barriers and became the first black female member of a provincial legislation and the first woman to work, run for leadership of a federal party. I was so excited when I got to meet her in St. John in the 1990s at a conference. My journey continued and early in the 1980s I founded a nonprofit organization with several key social workers. The organization's objectives included empowering girls and women. I continued to work on my university degrees while raising my children as a single parent and I became a proud member of the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers. I have two degrees and I, I find like I'm a dual citizen. I have a degree in, with social work <laughs> and with adult education, but they are a very good partnership and a good marriage because of all the skills I learned in both professions, I, can, I could use them uh, into, even into my life now. My career spanned for over 34 years before I came to the Senate. And like Senator Bernard, it, it's kind of like I'm a, I'm a social worker in the Senate and it's a wonderful experience. But truly, my greatest teachers or giants are the women and girls that I met during my career in nonprofit. Much of my social work practice involved group work and group therapy, especially around sexual abuse and violence. The effect and power of the group cannot be understated. The hundreds of women I met are truly inspirational. Often abused or living in poverty and facing challenges that require courage and resilience. I quickly realized that it took a dual approach, working with the client or the participant, but also working for societal change to remove those barriers. Often years later, I'd run into a woman who had been in one of our groups. I remember Tina, for example, at the hospital. I saw her and she turned out, she, she, took, she became a nurse and she said to me, I bet you thought I wouldn't do anything with my life. And I said, oh no, I knew you would. And I was so proud. And so often I meet women who've gone on and done other things. And I'm encouraged by that because these women have struggled with many life challenges. But their stories are always in my heart. So when I approach my work in the Senate, I often reflect on these women. Since coming to the Senate, I have learned and grown about systemic racism and racial injustice and its impact. Senator Bernard, my friend, has taught me so much about this. She's a great role model. Senator Boyer, my friend Amati, has taught me about Indigenous women and the unfair treatment around issues of forced sterilization and so many other issues. Senator Sinclair, his gentle approach but intelligent rapport, especially around the TRC, led me to learn more and become more actively involved. All of my colleagues at the Senate, in one way or another, have impacted my life. I sit on the Aboriginal People's Committee and Human Rights, where I learn daily about the issues in Canada. I am grateful for my experience in the Senate, especially as I have created relationships to learn about diversity. It's about developing meaningful relationships with people who can teach us, can understand, we can understand their challenges and our biases. As we develop policy and speak to legislation, I often draw from my community social work experience. One thing that speaks to me is not just to be a bystander, but to be a real ally and to work to change the systems that are racist and unequal. I'm still learning and growing, especially around the historical lenses. Whose history is it? Recently, our book club read the book White Fragility. A key learning was around white privilege. And even if we think we have evolved, we are not. I still have a lot to learn.
As I reach back to my province and engage with Indigenous social workers, I am trying to listen and learn from their perspectives, and it's been helpful. So with social workers, it's really, really important to stretch ourselves, to challenge our values and beliefs. We don't have all the knowledge right now, but we can learn it if we commit to it, especially around anti-racism. There are many resources and people can help us. Recently, I acquired a great resource from a friend, What Next, My White Friends? 101 Ways to Practice Anti-Racism. Our Senate is slowly evolving, but it will take openness and commitment to the long haul, not just during the pandemic. So I am committed to change and to being an ally. I will leave you with the words of Dr. Abram X. Kendi, author, professor, anti-racist activist, and historian of race and discrimination. And I quote, If we ignore the odds and fight to create an anti-racist world, then we can give humanity a chance to one day survive, a chance to live in communion, a chance to be forever free. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hartling. It's really interesting as I hear each one of our speakers talk about um, their own background and what led them to social work. So really, really uh, inspiring. So our next speaker is uh, Senator Margaret Don Anderson. And uh, Senator Anderson is a proud Unuk who has been a public servant with the Government of the Northwest Territories for more than 20 years, working with communities and Indigenous peoples across the Northwest Territories. Uh, and in this role, she's participated in the Anu I'm going to always say this wrong. Inuvil I can't, I can't. Inuvil oh, I'm going to say it totally wrong. Self-government. So you're going to have to correct me, Senator Anderson, because I said I would, <laughs> I would mess this up. Uh, regional Corporation to Prepare a Defense in the Community uh, Governance Project. And uh, she's been working with government on many levels, including uh, the government of the Northwest Territories, the Regional Corporation, and the Government of Canada. Um, so notably, you were the Director of Community Justice and Policing, where she implemented positive changes to the territorial justice system and also helped to develop and implement um, the Territories Wellness Court Program which was a therapeutic program that attempts to reduce recidivism by treating underlying issues like mental health, addictions, and cognitive challenges. So we're very pleased to have you here with us today uh, and from the Northwest Territories, where I believe you told me it's minus 30 at this moment. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, CASW, for putting on this event. Alkana, everybody. Those are the words my mother would say, so I am repeating them since she's no longer here to do it. So I will start with that. Kuyanaini for joining us during National Social Work Month as we celebrate you and the valuable work you do within your field of social work. It is my, ple my pleasure and my privilege to partake in the webinar this morning. I am pleased to join you from my home community of Tuktiaktuk, um, the traditional territory of the Inuvialuit. It is minus 30, it's minus 40 with the wind. Um, we do have sunlight till 9.30, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> it has been many years since I worked strictly as a social worker. When I began as a social worker, we were responsible for a number of areas, including child and family services, aged and handicapped, income support and income assistance, native custom adoption, and probation and parole. So as you can see, it, it, we had many hats. My inspiration for going into social work was, I grew up in Taktiaktik, which is a small community of 900. Uh, my friend at the time, her mother was a social worker and we often went to her office. And that was the one field that I learned of very young. At the age of, I believe it was 18, I started to work in a child welfare center. And the gentleman that was the director was very encouraging and encouraged me to apply for college as I had actually dropped out of high school. Um, I did not graduate. Um, so he assisted me in challenging the college entrance exam in Grant McEwen, um, and I was successful. I somehow convinced a professor who had come into Inuvik to accept me into the program and um, did my degree or my diploma with Grant McEwen in the child and youth care program. I subsequently finished my degree at the University of Victoria. Um, my mentors 
vary. Um, my greatest mentors is definitely my nanak and my dadak, my grandparents, my among my mother, um, and my culture. Very much um, growing up, everything is a community. Um, you're not um, an individual. Um, as a child, when you're born, you're giving an Inuvalik name. Um, my name was, is Paniok. And so very much for me, my life was not an individual life. It was a we. I was recognized as the woman who I was named after. Um, so you were always a part of a group. You were never, I never felt like it was just me alone, that um, there was a responsibility to look after each other. And I think that that has been my greatest influence moving forward. I have been um, very fortunate um, to find a path um, to get me to where I am today. I remember when I did my first year um, in Grant McEwen and the second year I thought, oh my God, it's too tough. I went to school, I was eight months pregnant. I had a two-year-old, I was a single parent. I actually applied for a job in Iqaluit and a gentleman answered the phone. And this gentleman who I did not know, cannot recall his name, convinced me to go back to school. And it was because of his influence that I went back and finished my second year. So I think you find, or influence finds you when you need it the most. And it's up to you to hear that. Just looking here. So all of my professional experience has been in various fields of health and social service and justice. I have worked as a probation officer, parole officer, manager, um, manager of projects and programs, director. I have been very fortunate in those roles to be able to be given the freedom to develop um, projects and programs that have a meaningful impact for people in the North that are built in the North, based in the North, based on our cultural understandings, um, based on our strengths, recognizes our challenges. Um, and that has allowed me to be part and parcel of the Domestic Violence Treatment Options Court program um, that is delivered for individuals um, dealing with um, um, their first initial charge in domestic violence offenses, and it's a co-ed program. I've also been fortunate to work and help develop the wellness court program that deals with clients with multiple complex issues, as well as the development um, and a pilot um, called the integrated case management that deals with clients with multiple complex issues across departments um, that engages the Departments of Health and Social Services, Department of Justice, um, Housing, um, Yellowknife Health and Social Services. It's very targeted to the individual, um, working with them in collaboration across the, the, the challenges and the boundaries that they come across in those departments. So it supports them. So, um, I just want to relay and tell you how essential y your role as a social worker is, that you may not understand how impactful that role is. Um, I'm going to relay a story. So many years ago as a social worker, I did an apprehension. Um, and in the North, we're faced with many challenges. One of them was the, the lack of emergency foster homes um, in the North. I apprehended an individual. Um, 20 years later, I was walking through a store and this individual stopped me and asked to speak with me. I felt obligated. I believe I owed the individual that much. I sat down with them and this individual proceeded to, to tell me um, her recollections of when I brought them into my home because I was actually, they actually stayed in my home for a number of weeks because we had no placement until we could secure a placement in the South. This individual stayed in my home, lived with me, lived with my children, was cared for like my child. And I brought this individual South when the placement was secured. This individual proceeded to tell me that she had waited for me, waited for me to come back to get her. Um, 
for a long time. What had happened was I actually had left social services by then. So I never did go back to pick her up. So the work that you do um, may not, it may, you may not understand the importance of it at that time, but it is important, it's important to those children's children, to the family, to the communities that you work for, that you might not remember something, but these minds and these families and children and communities that we work for do. So just to be mindful of the role you play and how important it is to those that you work with. I, I just want to convey as well that I think it's important um, as social workers to understand the history of individuals, communities, groups in the territory where you work, the historical impacts and colonization effects on the perception of social work and of the social work system. Um, and as a social worker, there are periods where you also in your work have to dismantle, educate, also be willing to learn and listen to some very difficult truths. And I recognize that you guys all work very hard. I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. And thank you for this opportunity and wish you all well and stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much, Senator Anderson. That's uh, making me think as well about uh, something that was said to me when I started social work and I had done political science and didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, my, one of my social work professors, um, Sheena Finley at Memorial University, said, never doubt the impact that you may have on someone's life. You may not see it at that moment, but you always have an impact, even though it may not be spoken aloud. So very important. Thank you so much. Um, our chat line is open. So we have opportunity now for questions that you may have. So please type them in and we'll only be too happy to uh, to ask our senators. Uh, this may be the one opportunity that you get to have three senators live and uh, willing to talk. So uh, normally when we do, as Dr. Uh, Senator um, Bernard had said about the social work on the on the hill uh you know it's usually an in-person event and it's a wonderful event however as uh, zoom and other platforms have given this opportunity to us to be able to go right across the country which we normally would never get an opportunity to do so while we're waiting for some questions i'm going to jump in and um uh, we've talked a little bit about COVID and challenges that we've all been facing. Um, and our theme for the month is social work being essential. Um, do you still believe that social work is essential, especially now during the pandemic? And I guess what's going to happen after? Because I don't think the pandemic is over, despite what I may see sometimes on social media and depending on where you live. So I'm just going to open that up to you all. Well, maybe I'll start. Sure. Is that okay? I would say yes, that. perfect. Thank you. I, I would say that social work is absolutely even more essential because one of the things that we've noticed through the pandemic is that those who are most disenfranchised have been most negatively impacted by the pandemic. So so think about the the folks who are essential workers, folks who are not able to work from home, folks who live in multi-generational households, folks who are uh, in low income or precarious employment, folks who have lost their jobs and, and not having that financial security to fall back on. And overwhelmingly, most of those folks are racialized. Many are new Canadians. Many are people who don't have a lot of supports. I also think about the children who are now in the second year of their education being impacted by COVID. And not all children have equitable access to educational resources that will help them to succeed and to thrive. So I would, my sense is that social work is even more essential. And we're going to be dealing with the impacts of COVID for many years to come, I think. 
Yeah, I, I support uh, what Cinder Bernard's saying. And I also notice in our province, I've been doing a little bit of research with talking to different people, especially around issues of domestic violence and um, things like that, where uh, women are very isolated. And I think that social workers are, are carrying a very heavy load right now. And I'm sure their mental health is being affected as well, because the hard work they have to do you know, before pandemic, but even now with all the issues, uh, it could be domestic violence or working with seniors or children. And I, I think that um, it's it's really uh, going to go on for a long time, but I think it's to recognize that. And I hope there's a forum where social workers get to talk about the stresses that they're impacted by during this time, because I think the job has become even more difficult. And, um, you know, we need to move through this. And I think it's to honor our profession. Often our profession isn't honored as well as it could be and how essential it is, because I think that we're going to need social workers even more uh, in the future. So let's, uh, let's give, uh, you know, a Another shout out to all those out there working in this field, but also to say, I hope that there's ways in which people who are working in the field get to talk about the stresses and the mental health they're experiencing during this time, the load they're carrying. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll toss this question to Senator Anderson um, and, the, and uh, the, the others can join in if you want to. What is the most challenging part of working in the political world? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I'm glad you um, gave that I... to Senator Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> I would say for for me as a professional, um, and coming from the north, one of the most challenging um, pieces is the lack of understanding of the north. Um, the lack of awareness of the historical impacts and the colonization um, that has happened. And sometimes the catchword um, reconciliation um, and consultation for me are <laughs> challenging words because if there is no meaning and no definition of what that looks like and no standard definition of what that looks like, it's applied differently across the board and inconsistently. And, and when you're looking at the implementation of legislation that affects all Canadians, yet all Canadians do not have fair and equal access and are not on the same footing um, in terms of housing, food security, health, uh, mental health um, services, programs, it's really difficult I, to... Um, to um, convey those concerns in a um, political format um, to uh, senators across the provinces and territories and to explain um, why that legislation is a challenge in your territory. Okay. Uh, Senator, uh, is there any, anything else that uh, either one of you would like to add to that? I, I, I'd like to add, I, I don't want to shy away mm -hmm. from the question. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a really good question. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that one of the things that I find most challenging is the way in which partisan politics gets in the way of good governance, mm -hmm. good discussion and debate about critical issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with uh, Senator Bernard. And I think what's difficult too is that when I came in, of course, I'm coming in from the community and community collaboration and how we're going to work together. And and then to see how the partisanship and the people dig their heels in and, and not are not open, it, it, that made it very, very hard. And I find that, you know, sometimes it was heavy because you didn't, you didn't, I didn't expect that, even though I know politics is politics, but that whole thing about disagreeing because that's the side of politics you sit on. I found that really, really hard. So one of the things I've been working on in the last, since I've been there, is trying to meet each individual senator on a personal level. Uh, and some it's easier than others. And just saying, oh, and you're from where? And, you know, how did you, how long have you been here? And trying to find a way to connect with them. Because that kind of, you know, um, energy, negative energy, I guess, is it, hard sometimes. It's not the same as the way we worked in the community. Even if we didn't agree in the community, you could find ways in which you could maybe move things forward. But this this weighs us down and it takes energy. 
Mm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, one of our other questions actually from Sky, um, I think ties in actually to that question. And she says, living in the South and she lives in the Medicine Hat, uh, she asked Senator Anderson, what would it be the most important element you would like to tell us in the South that are so far away from this part of Canada? Um. I'm not sure I have the right answer, but I have an answer. Mm -hmm. I okay. <laughs> I the north the the north. When I go south, to me, it's very different. Um, when I go to a province, it's it's different than the north. Um, the north is made up of 33 communities. Um, there's one large city center that's Yellowknife, but the northern communities, the 33 communities, 21 of them are fly-in communities only. The infrastructure in the north, um, the diversity in the north, we have 11 official languages. Um, we have land claims holders. We have um, self-government um, holders. And for me as a um, representing the north, it's really important um, to try and not speak on behalf of everyone recognizing the diversity it's important for me to meet with partner with as many um, indigenous groups governments municipal governments uh, territorial governments um, and any organization representing uh, minority groups minority languages the language commissioner i think it's important um, no matter where you're from to make sure that you don't speak on behalf of everyone that what you bring forward is what your partners, uh, the people you collaborate with, the people you meet with, um, that that's a really important piece of um, working in any area is that um, you don't assume and you don't speak for everyone. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So thank you okay. for that question. Okay. Yeah, we have lots of questions flying in at this moment, so I'm going to try to do my best to get to as many as I can with the time that uh, we have available. Um, I will toss this out to maybe Senator Hartling here. Uh, what characteristics or skills do you use as a social worker that separates you from other senators? And I would, and if uh, oh. everyone wanted to, giant, to giant, jump in, that'd be great. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's a big, that's a heavy duty question. Well, I think, you know, I think that as a social worker, our, our characteristics and our practice, you know, communication is an important tool in our toolkit for being a social worker. Social worker. So I try to employ that and I try to remain calm and uh, to engage people and try to ask questions. Uh, you know, what will, what, what's your perspective on that? Maybe I won't agree, but I try to bring in some of those um, skills that I have in my practice from my practice and I think you know there are other people that have them for sure but what it what's interesting is to be in such a diverse group with people from across the country and with different life experiences and different professions so um, it, it, I guess it's about being open and uh, that's one of the skills that I have that I bring uh, my openness so I guess that's what I would say okay perfect um, how do you think that uh, you're able to represent the voices of black and marginalized people in your work on the Hill? I'll toss that open. Maybe I'll, I'll start with that one. Sure. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's about using your voice. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, speaking out and speaking up. And it's something Senator Hartling talked earlier in her opening remarks, she talked about being an ally and not a bystander. And so it's, it's, it's finding the courage to be brave when it's very difficult to do so because of everything that's happening around you. And, and sometimes that can be very, very difficult. And sometimes it can put you into a rather unpopular space. Mm -hmm. But I, I see it as a responsibility. I didn't apply to become a senator because, you know, I wanted something individually. I applied to become a senator because I felt that I had something to contribute. And my way of contributing is, is by using my voice at uh, each opportunity that I can. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very, thank you very much. Um, a couple of people are asking, um, would you say that it's important or a requirement to spend years in the field before pursuing policy making and eventually then parliament? Um, and that's being asked by a student with a passion for activism, de advocacy, decolonization, indigenization, and change. So, well, I, think I guess that's the question really, really is, yeah, yes, go, go ahead, ahead, Joan, sorry, no. No, no, you go ahead, please. Okay, no, I guess I guess that it certainly helps the more experiences you have. Um, I think working in the field certainly gives you the um, the lens on what what what's really going on with people. I'm thankful for that for myself personally that I had that experience, and um, so that I could build on what what are the policies and how do they fit with the people that I've worked with. So, I think the more experiences we can have in our field and then grow into being the policymaker, whatever, however we do that, social uh, activism, social justice, whatever it is, um, I think that's important. Um, not that you have to have all those experiences, like I guess I would use an example, if you're not a parent, you still might have suggestions about parenting, you would know some things about mm -hmm. that. But I think it certainly helps to have, like I always think about, like I was spoke to a bill a few months ago on um, looking at a judge's training on uh, sexual harassment and, and and, uh, and that and, and it helped me to have think about the women that I'd worked with and what they told me about how the abuse had affected them and what I think a judge would need to know in order to be able to see a, to hear a case so I think there's there's that sort of um, you know the more you have the more you learn the more you know the better you can do your job I don't know if that answers the question but that's what I think mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm just going to toss I, this out. Uh, yes, go right ahead, please. Could I, could I add something to that, please? Absolutely. To, to response to that question. I would say, so with young people, uh, you want to harness that energy and that leadership. So one of the things that I would say is that when I think about my own journey, I, I really had two educational tracks that I was on. So one was the post-secondary education but the other was the social justice education. And so learning and engaging and participating and being involved, and that's really, really good preparation. It helps you really develop those uh, leadership skills, helps you develop those skills around uh, being an advocate, being an ally. And it's, it's, it's wonderful learning, learning ground for eventual work as a parliamentarian, as a senator, or whatever you may end up doing in the political world. But doing that work, using your leadership skills early on is really, really, really important. Even in, in, in high school and, and so on, we try to instill in people the leadership they have within themselves. So not thinking about leaders as people in position, but really thinking about the leadership qualities that we all have and how we can develop those. And that will put you in in, in um, good position for whatever you choose in life. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this one to Senator Anderson. Uh, can you speak a little bit about your experience about being a woman in politics? And what advice would you give to a f young female social worker wanting to enter politics or the world that, of the political world? That's a loaded question. Um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite frank, um, I did not aim to enter politics. Um, because of the work that I've done throughout, um, I guess, my whole professional career, I learned that politics plays a really um, pivotal role in in the work that you do. Um, when you when I did social work, you went by the Child and Family Services Act or the Child Welfare Act, which was the initial act I dealt with, and then the Child and Family Services Act, and you learned that those words in that legislation impacted the way you did your work. It governed it. It told you how you had to do it, regardless as to whether or not it um, worked in your community, worked in your culture, you were bound to apply those rules. Um, 
which was really difficult for me to do being a social worker in my own community when you're um, intervening and apprehending children of family members, um, going to court, um, taking those children out of the community, you learned that it's that legislation um, that you're applying that dictates the way you do your job. And when I moved into doing Department of Justice and working with courts and still working within legislation, legislation in every job that I did applied. Um, and I learned the importance of what's in that document and how that document can affect and does affect um, us in the North um, as minorities, as Indigenous peoples, um, and does but yet failed to recognize that impact on us. Um, so I think that for me, it's not just being a woman, it's being anybody in politics any, and um, the importance of it. It was my daughter, my 12-year-old um, daughter who convinced me to apply um, to be a senator. Um, she um, kept asking me, did you apply yet? Did you apply yet? And it was on the final day 15 minutes before it closed that I submitted my application after she had asked me four times. So I would have to say that I'm actually here because of my daughter. Um, so I always tell her she's who I want to be when I grow up because she's definitely my greatest inspiration. So nice. thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that um, either one of our other two uh, guests would like to add to that to that question? Hmm. Maybe, I, I know we're going to be out of time, so maybe we'll pick that up when we uh, gather in two weeks' time. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Sometimes social workers feel that they are powerless, uh, given the type of work that we do, working with people who are very marginalized and very vulnerable. So as a senator, do you think that you're able to impact legislation from a social work, feminist, or, or racialized perspective? Do you think you make an impact? Senator Hartling? Oh, well, I think that's a really good question, too. And I and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. I guess it depends on what's going on. <laughs> Things take a long time in the Senate to go through, but sometimes we have some wins, I guess, and things that happen, and you think, wow, we were able to do that. Um, I think that we've been working long and hard to have a change in our sexual harassment policy, um, and uh, that's happening, and there's some other bills that came through that, you know, you feel that, they will impact Canadians in a very positive way. But it's not without ups and downs. Like it certainly doesn't happen easily, quickly. But I do feel, I think what I really appreciate is having the friendships, like my friend's friend, uh, Senator Bernard or other senators, that we can talk things out when we're feeling discouraged. Like say we have something we wanted to go through and it's not going through and and it's difficult. It's having that um, friendship and that um, conversation with people to say, well, how can we move this forward? What can we do? And um, so I think we are making some changes, but like I said, sometimes it's difficult. And, and um, you know, maybe when I look back over my career as a senator, I'll be able to come back and say, okay, this is what, <laughs> this is what it looked like. But um, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Anybody else like to join in? No? Okay. Uh, I think um, Senator... One, I think Senator yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, no, no, I would please. absolutely... I, I would agree with Senator Hartling. And, you know, I would say that what's important is that we never give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we we look at, you know... And, and, and I'd like us to try to move away from this notion of winning or losing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even when you don't succeed in, in moving an issue in a particular way, even if you, even if you um, have your, what you want to say about that, if you have that on the record, that will make a difference. That will have an impact on somebody. But it's, it's that notion of never giving up because things move very slowly, as she said. Um, Senator Bernard, I'll ask this next question to you. Uh, do you think it makes a difference having a social worker in the Senate? Oh, absolutely. 
absolutely. I would say that that as a social worker, you know, bringing that lens and bringing some of those skills, and Senator Harkin talked about some of those social work skills that she uses. I would would I would agree with that, and and I would say that one of the themes that keeps playing out for me is the theme about positive disruption. And I, I neglected to mention the former Dean of Social Work at Faculty of, uh, Cal uh, Faculty of Social Work at the uh, University of Calgary, Dr. Jackie Seepert. He was the person who introduced that, that name, positive disruption, to me. And I, I love that name. And that's a theme, as I said earlier, it's a theme I've used throughout my career. And as a social worker, it's a theme I, I try to bring into our discussions in the Senate. So social work is essential. The social work practice that people do on the ground is essential. And the social work lens that we bring to our discussions about legislation in the Senate, I, I would say it's, essence, it's essential. <laughs> and it's wonderful. I'm really pleased to have fellow social workers in the Senate who are engaging in these tough conversations with us because together we're stronger. You know, absolutely, together we're stronger. Thank you so much. Um, one question I guess I would, I would kind of uh, like to ask each of you. Um, if you had one piece of advice to give to students, um, who are doing social work, what would it be? And I'll start with Senator Anderson. So one piece of advice that you okay. would give a student, a student social worker. I would say, don't doubt yourself. Um, you, you're, you're looking at a career for a reason. Um, trust that what you're doing is right. Don't forget to look after yourself, I think is key. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a social worker, and I was a young social worker, um, that sometimes that's lost, that your own, your own well-being um, and the well-being of your family and your children is as important. Um, I often tease my two oldest children. I call them my social workers because they are very much um, caring. They brought children home who had nowhere to go. Um, they always looked out for other children because of the career that I did when they were young. So I think it's important that when you go into the field of social work that trust who you are, rely on yourself, know your history, understand where your people came from, and don't be afraid of um, moving ahead and take advantage of every opportunity that's given to you. Um, it may be an accidental one um, and uh, take any hand that's offered to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Senator Hartling, oh, any that's advice? Great. Yes, well, I think I was thinking about that. What would I tell someone? Because I do believe in mentoring those of us that have gone through. If we could be a mentor, it's very helpful. But I guess trust your inner knowing. Sometimes those gut feelings, we say, oh, no, that's not. But listen to your inner your inner voice. Um, use your voice. Find a way to use your voice. And um, find a mentor, if you can, that will, you know, be able to, um, you can have conversations with about those tough th things that you that happen. And like Senator Bernard said, never give up. Never give up. Perfect. Senator Bernard, any, any, any piece of advice that you would like to give a young social worker or a social work student? One of the things that I would say is believe in yourself, lift as you lead, and be an encourager. And when you encourage someone, social workers, no matter where we end up working, we are working with the most, some of the most vulnerable people in our society. People who are not, who don't believe in themselves. And part of our job is to help them learn to believe in themselves, learn to find critical hope when there's no hope. And I want to thank one of the people who's been that person for me, who believed in me when I 
did not, could not believe in myself. So on this World Social Work Day, I want to do a shout out to Dr. Lena Dominelli, who believed in me and encouraged me and gave me such critical hope at a time when I needed it most. And to social workers today, I want to say to you, you be that Lena Dominelli for someone else, for the people you're working with. Thank you. Thank you to everyone today who participated. We're at the end of our time, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But this has just been a, just a wonderful conversation and dialogue and has really, really uh, made me stop and think. And um, I'm always amazed by the fact that um, every every opportunity, every conversation is able to do that. It helps me think in different ways. And that's one thing that I think I've learned from being a social worker, that there's no one answer, but, you know, we all can learn from each other. I want to thank each one of our speakers. Um, and today, uh, amazing. Um, we are going to have you, we're going to be back at this again in about two weeks. So look forward to, to the conversation again. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in today um, and your insightful questions and just made this a really wonderful opportunity to celebrate um, World Social Work Day. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. And goodbye for now. We'll see you in two weeks. Uh -huh.